Chapter 60, Part 3 of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Chapter 60, The Fourth Crusade, Part 3. But these generous deliverers were unwilling to release their hostage till they had obtained from his father the payment, or at least the promise, of their recompense. They chose four ambassadors, Matthew of Montmorency, our historian the Marshal of Champagne, and two Venetians, to congratulate the emperor. The gates were thrown open on their approach, the streets on both sides were lined with the battle-axes of the Danish and English guard, the presence chamber glittered with gold and jewels, the false substitute of virtue and power. By the side of the blind Isaac his wife was seated, the sister of the king of Hungary, and by her appearance the noble matrons of Greece were drawn from their domestic retirement, and mingled with the circle of senators and soldiers. The Latins, by the mouth of the marshal, spoke like men conscious of their merits, but who respected the work of their own hands. And the emperor clearly understood that his son's engagements with Venice and the pilgrims must be ratified without hesitation or delay. Withdrawing into a private chamber with the empress, a chamberlain, an interpreter, and the four ambassadors, the father of young Alexius inquired with some anxiety into the nature of his stipulations. The submission of the Eastern Empire to the Pope, the succour of the Holy Land, and a present contribution of two hundred thousand marks of silver. These conditions are weighty, was his prudent reply. They are hard to accept and difficult to perform but no conditions can exceed the measure of your services and deserts. After this satisfactory assurance, the barons mounted on horseback and introduced the heir of Constantinople to the city and palace. His youth and marvellous adventures engaged every heart in his favour, and Alexius was solemnly crowned with his father in the dome of St. Sophia. In the first days of his reign, the people, already blessed with the restoration of plenty and peace, was delighted by the joyful catastrophe of the tragedy, and the discontent of the nobles, their regret and their fears, were covered by the polished surface of pleasure and loyalty. The mixture of two discordant nations in the same capital might have been pregnant with mischief and danger, and the suburb of Galata or Pera was assigned for the quarters of the French and Venetians. But the liberty of trade and familiar intercourse was allowed between the friendly nations, and each day the pilgrims were tempted by devotion or curiosity to visit the churches and palaces of Constantinople. Their rude minds, insensible perhaps of the finer arts, were astonished by the magnificent scenery and the poverty of their native towns enhanced the populousness and riches of the first metropolis of Christendom. Descending from his state, young Alexius was prompted by interest and gratitude to repeat his frequent and familiar visits to his Latin allies, and in the freedom of the table, the gay petulance of the French sometimes forgot the Emperor of the East. In their most serious conferences, it was agreed, that the reunion of the two churches must be the result of patience and time. But avarice was less tractable than zeal, and a larger sum was instantly dispersed to appease the wants and silence the importunity of the crusaders. Alexius was alarmed by the approaching hour of their departure. Their absence might have relieved him from the engagement which he was yet incapable of performing, but his friends would have left him, naked and alone, to the caprice and prejudice of a perfidious nation. He wished to bribe their stay, the delay of a year, 
by undertaking to, def to defray their expense and to satisfy in their name the freight of the Venetian vessels. The offer was agitated in the council of the barons, and, after a repetition of their debates and scruples, a majority of votes again acquiesced in the advice of the doge and the prayer of the young emperor. At the price of sixteen hundred pounds of gold, he prevailed on the Marquis of Montferrat to lead him with an army round the provinces of Europe, to establish his authority and pursue his uncle, while Constantinople was awed by the presence of Baldwin and his confederates of France and Flanders. The expedition was successful. The blind emperor exulted in the success of his arms, and listened to the predictions of his flatterers, that the same providence which had raised him from the dungeon to the throne would heal his gout, restore his sight, and watch over the long prosperity of his reign. Yet the mind of the suspicious old man was tormented by the rising glories of his son, nor could his pride conceal from his envy that while his own name was pronounced in faint and reluctant acclamations, the royal youth was the theme of spontaneous and universal praise. By the recent invasion, the Greeks were awakened from a dream of nine centuries. From the vain presumption that the capital of the Roman Empire was impregnable to foreign arms, the strangers of the West had violated the city and bestowed the scepter of Constantine. Their imperial clients soon became as unpopular as themselves. The well-known vices of Isaac were rendered still more contemptible by his infirmities, and the young Alexius was hated as an apostate who had renounced the manners and religion of his country. His secret covenant with the Latins was divulged or suspected. The people, and especially the clergy, were devoutly attached to their faith and superstition, and every convent and every shop resounded with the danger of the church and the tyranny of the pope. An empty treasury could ill supply the demands of regal luxury and foreign extortion. The Greeks refused to avert, by a general tax, the impending evils of servitude and pillage. The oppression of the rich excited a more dangerous and personal resentment, and if the emperor melted the plate and despoiled the images of the sanctuary, he seemed to justify the complaints of heresy and sacrilege. During the absence of Marquis Boniface and his imperial pupil, Constantinople was visited with a calamity which might be justly imputed to the zeal and indiscretion of the Flemish pilgrims. In one of their visits to the city, they were scandalized by the aspect of a mosque or synagogue in which one god was worshipped without a partner or a son. Their effectual mode of controversy was to attack the infidels with the sword and their habitation with fire. But the infidels, and some Christian neighbours, presumed to defend their lives and properties, and the flames which bigotry had kindled consumed the most orthodox and innocent structures. During eight days and nights the conflagration spread above a league in front, from the harbour to the Propontis, over the thickest and most populous regions of the city. It is not easy to count the stately churches and palaces that were reduced to a smoking ruin, to value the merchandise that perished in the trading streets, or to number the families that were involved in the common destruction. By this outrage, which the doge and the barons in vain affected to disclaim, the name of the Latins became still more unpopular, and the colony of that nation, above fifteen thousand persons, consulted their safety in a hasty retreat from the city to the protection of their standard in the suburb of Pera. The emperor returned in triumph, but the firmest and most dexterous policy would have been insufficient to steer him through the tempest, which overwhelmed the person and government of that unhappy youth. <laughs>
his own inclination and his father's advice attached him to his benefactors. But Alexius hesitated between gratitude and patriotism, between the fear of his subjects and of his allies. By his feeble and fluctuating conduct, he lost the esteem and confidence of both, and while he invited the Marquis of Montferrat to occupy the palace, he suffered the nobles to conspire, and the people to arm, for the deliverance of their country. Regardless of his painful situation, the Latin chiefs repeated their demands, resented his delays, suspected his intentions, and exacted a decisive answer of peace or war. The haughty summons was delivered by three French knights and three Venetian deputies, who girded their swords, mounted their horses, pierced through the angry multitude, and entered, with a fearful countenance, the palace and presence of the Greek emperor. In a peremptory tone they, re they recapitulated their services and his engagements, and boldly declared that unless their just claims were fully and immediately satisfied, they should no longer hold him either as a sovereign or a friend. After this defiance, the first that had ever wounded an imperial ear, they departed without betraying any symptoms of fear, but their escape from a servile palace and a furious city astonished the ambassadors themselves, and their return to the camp was the signal of mutual hostility. Among the Greeks, all authority and wisdom were overborne by the impetuous multitude who mistook their rage for valour, their numbers for strength, and their fanaticism for the support and inspiration of heaven. In the eyes of both nations, Alexius was false and contemptible. The base and spurious race of the Angeli was rejected with clamorous disdain, and the people of Constantinople encompassed the Senate to demand at their hands a more worthy emperor. To every senator, conspicuous by his birth or dignity, they successively presented the purple. By each senator the deadly garment was repulsed. The contest lasted three days, and we may learn from the historian Nicetus, one of the members of the assembly, that fear and weaknesses were the guardians of their loyalty. A phantom, who vanished in oblivion, was forcibly proclaimed by the crowd, but the author of the tumult and the leader of the war was a prince of the house of Ducas, and his common appellation of Alexius must be discriminated by the epithet of Morzuful, which in the vulgar idiom expressed the close junction of his black and shaggy eyebrows. At once a patriot and a courtier, the perfidious Morzuful, who was not destitute of cunning and courage, opposed the Latins, both in speech and action, inflamed the passions and prejudices of the Greeks, and insinuated himself into the favour and confidence of Alexius, who trusted him with the office of great chamberlain, and tinged his buskins with the colours of royalty. At the dead of night, he rushed into the bedchamber with an affrighted aspect, exclaiming that the palace was attacked by the people and betrayed by the guards. Starting from his couch, the unsuspecting prince threw himself into the arms of his enemy, who had contrived his escape by a private staircase. But that staircase terminated in a prison. Alexius was seized, stripped, and loaded with chains, and... After tasting some days the bitterness of death, he was poisoned, or strangled, or beaten with clubs, at the command, or in the presence, of the tyrant. The Emperor Isaac Angelus soon followed his son to the grave, and more zooful, perhaps, might spare the superfluous crime of hastening the extinction of impotence and blindness. The death of the emperors and the usurpation of Morzuful had changed the nature of the quarrel. 
It was no longer the disagreement of allies who overvalued their services or neglected their obligations. The French and Venetians forgot their complaints against Alexius, dropped a tear on the untimely fate of their companion, and swore revenge against the perfidious nation who had crowned his assassin. Yet the prudent Doge was still inclined to negotiate. He asked as a debt, a subsidy, or a fine, fifty thousand pounds of gold, about two millions sterling, nor would the conference have been abruptly broken if the zeal or policy of Morzufel had not refused to sacrifice the Greek church to the safety of the state. Amidst the invectives of his foreign and domestic enemies, we may discern that he was not unworthy of the character which he had assumed, of the public champion. The second siege of Constantinople was far more laborious than the first. The treasury was replenished, and discipline was restored by a severe inquisition into the abuses of the former reign. And more zooful, an iron mace in his hand, visiting the posts and affecting the port and aspect of a warrior, was an object of terror to his soldiers, at least, and to his kinsmen. Before and after the death of Alexius, the Greeks made two vigorous and well-conducted attempts to burn the navy in the harbour. But the skill and courage of the Venetians repulsed the fire-ships, and the vagrant flames wasted themselves without injury in the sea. In a nocturnal sally, the Greek emperor was vanquished by Henry, brother of the Count of Flanders. The advantages of number and surprise aggravated the shame of his defeat. His buckler was found on the field of battle, and the imperial standard, a divine image of the Virgin, was presented as a trophy and a relic to the Cistercian monks, the disciples of St. Bernard. Near three months, without accepting the holy season of Lent, were consumed in skirmishes and preparations, before the Latins were ready or resolved for a general assault. The land fortifications had been found impregnable, and the Venetian pilots represented that, on the shore of the Propontis, the anchorage was unsafe, and the ships must be driven by the current far away to the straits of the Hellespont, a prospect not unpleasing to the reluctant pilgrims, who sought every opportunity of breaking the army. From the harbour, therefore, the assault was determined by the assailants, and expected by the besieged, and the emperor had placed his scarlet pavilions on a neighbouring height, to direct and animate the efforts of his troops. A fearless spectator, whose mind could entertain the ideas of pomp and pleasure, might have admired the long array of two embattled armies, which extended above half a league, the one on the ships and galleys, the other on the walls and towers, raised above the ordinary level by several stages of wooden turrets. Their first fury was spent in the discharge of darts, stones, and fire from the engines. But the water was deep, the French were bold, the Venetians were skilful, they approached the walls, and a desperate conflict of swords, spears, and battle-axes was fought on the trembling bridges that grappled the floating to the stable batteries. In more than a hundred places the assault was urged and the defence was sustained, till the superiority of ground and numbers finally prevailed, and the Latin trumpets sounded a retreat. On the ensuing days the attack was renewed with equal vigour at a similar event, and, in the night, the doge and the barons held a council, apprehensive only for the public danger. Not a voice pronounced the words of escape or treaty, and each warrior, according to his temper, embraced the hope of victory, or the assurance of a glorious death. By the experience of the former siege, the Greeks were instructed, but the Latins were animated, and the knowledge that Constantinople might be taken was of more avail than the local precautions which that knowledge had inspired for its defence. In the third assault, two ships were linked together to double their strength. A strong north wind drove them on the shore. The bishops of Troyes and Soissons led the van. 
and the auspicious names of the pilgrim and the paradise resounded along the line. The episcopal banners were displayed on the walls, a hundred marks of silver had been promised to the first adventurers, and if their reward was intercepted by death, their names have been immortalized by fame. Four towers were scaled, three gates were burst open, and the French knights, who might tremble on the waves, felt themselves invincible on horseback on the solid ground. Shall I relate that the thousands who guarded the emperor's person fled on the approach and before the lance of a single warrior? Their ignominious flight is attested by their countryman Nicetus. An army of phantoms march with the French hero, and he was magnified to a giant in the eyes of the Greeks. While the fugitives deserted their posts and cast away their arms, the Latins entered the city under the banners of their leaders. The streets and gates opened for their passage, and either design or accident kindled a third conflagration, which consumed in a few hours the measure of three of the largest cities of France. In the close of evening, the barons checked their troops and fortified their stations. They were awed by the extent and populousness of the capital, which might yet require the labour of a month, if the churches and palaces were conscious of their internal strength. But in the morning a suppliant procession, with crosses and images, announced the submission of the Greeks, and deprecated the wrath of the conquerors. The usurper escaped through the golden gate. The palaces of Blachernay and Boussoulon were occupied by the Count of Flanders and the Marquis of Montferrat, and the empire which still bore the name of Constantine and the title of Roman was subverted by the arms of the Latin pilgrims. Constantinople had been taken by storm, and no restraints except those of religion and humanity were imposed on the conquerors by the laws of war. Boniface, Marquis of Montferrat, still acted as their general, and the Greeks who revered his name as that of their future sovereign were heard to exclaim in a lamentable tone, Holy Marquis King, have mercy upon us! His prudence or compassion opened the gates of the city to the fugitives, and he exhorted the soldiers of the cross to spare the lives of their fellow Christians. The streams of blood that flowed down the pages of Nicetus may be reduced to the slaughter of two thousand of his unresisting countrymen, and the greater part was massacred not by the strangers, but by the Latins, who had been driven from the city, and who were exercised the revenge of a triumphant faction. Yet of these exiles, some were less mindful of injuries than of benefits, and Nicetus himself was indebted for his safety to the generosity of a Venetian merchant. Pope Innocent III accuses the pilgrims for respecting in their lust neither age nor sex nor religious profession, and bitterly laments that the deeds of darkness, fornication, adultery, and incest were perpetrated in open day, and that noble matrons and holy nuns were polluted by the grooms and peasants of the Catholic camp. It is indeed probable that the license of victory prompted and covered a multitude of sins. But it is certain that the capital of the East contained a stock of venal or willing beauty, sufficient to satiate the desires of twenty thousand pilgrims, and female prisoners were no longer subject to the right or abuse of domestic slavery. The Marquis of Montferrat was the patron of discipline and decency. The Count of Flanders was the mirror of chastity. They had forbidden, under pain of death, the rape of married women, or virgins, or nuns, and the proclamation was sometimes invoked by the vanquished and respected by the victors. Their cruelty and lust were moderated by the authority of the chiefs and feelings of the soldiers, for we are no longer describing an eruption of the northern savages, and however ferocious they might still appear, time, policy, and religion had civilized the manners of the French, and still more of the Italians. But a free scope was allowed to their avarice, which was glutted, even in the Holy Week, by the pillage of Constantinople. 
the right of victory unshackled by any promise or treaty had confiscated the public and private wealth of the greeks and every hand according to its size and strength might lawfully execute the sentence and seize the forfeiture a portable and universal standard of exchange was found in the coined and uncoined metals of gold and silver which each captor at home or abroad might convert into the possessions most suitable to his temper and situation of the treasures which trade and luxury had accumulated the silks velvets furs the gems spices and rich movables were the most precious as they could not be procured for money in the ruder countries of europe an order of rapine was instituted nor was the share of each individual abandoned to industry or chance under the tremendous penalties of perjury excommunication and death the latins were bound to deliver their plunder into the common stock three churches were selected for the deposit and distribution of the spoil a single share was allotted to a foot soldier two for a sergeant on horseback four to a knight and larger proportions according to the rank and merit of the barons and princes for violating this sacred engagement a knight belonging to the count of st paul was hanged with his shield and coat of arms round his neck his example might render similar offenders more artful and discreet but avarice was more powerful than fear and it is generally believed that the secret far exceeded the acknowledged plunder yet the magnitude of the prize surpassed the largest scale of experience or expectation after the whole had been equally divided between the french and venetians fifty thousand marks were deducted to satisfy the debts of the former and the demands of the latter the residue of the french amounted to four hundred thousand marks of silver about eight hundred thousand pounds sterling nor can i better appreciate the value of that sum in the public and private transactions of the age than by defining it as seven times the annual revenue of the kingdom of england in this great revolution we enjoy the singular felicity of comparing the narratives of viadouin and necetus the opposite feelings of the marshal of champagne and the byzantine senator at the first view it should seem that the wealth of constantinople was only transferred from one nation to another and that the loss and sorrow of the greeks is exactly balanced by the joy and advantage of the latins but in the miserable account of war the gain is never equivalent to the loss the pleasure to the pain the smiles of the latins were transient and fallacious the Greeks for ever wept over the ruins of their country, and their real calamities were aggravated by sacrilege and mockery. What benefits accrued to the conquerors from the three fires which annihilated so vast a portion of the buildings and riches of the city? What a stock of such things as could neither be used nor transported was maliciously or wantonly destroyed? how much treasure was idly wasted in gaming debauchery and riot and what precious objects were bartered for a vile price by the impatience or ignorance of the soldiers whose reward was stolen by the base industry of the last of the greeks these alone who had nothing to lose might derive some profit from the revolution but the misery of the upper ranks of society is strongly painted in the personal adventures of nicetas himself his stately palace had been reduced to ashes in the second conflagration and the senator with his family and friends found an obscure shelter in another house which he possessed near the church of st sophia it was the door of this mean habitation that his friend the venetian merchant guarded in the disguise of a soldier till nicetas could save by a precipitate flight the relics of his fortune and the chastity of his daughter in a cold wintry season these fugitives nursed in the lap of prosperity departed on foot his wife was with child the desertion of their slaves compelled them to carry their baggage on their own shoulders and their women 
whom they placed in the centre, were exhorted to conceal their beauty with dirt, instead of adorning it with paint and jewels. Every step was exposed to insult and danger. The threats of the strangers were less painful than the taunts of the plebeians, with whom they were now levelled. Nor did the exiles breathe in safety till their mournful pilgrimage was concluded at Salimbria, above forty miles from the capital. On the way they overtook the patriarch, without attendance and almost without apparel, riding on an ass, and reduced to a state of apostolical poverty, which, had it been voluntary, might perhaps have been meritorious. In the meanwhile, his desolate churches were profaned by the licentiousness and party zeal of the Latins. After stripping the gems and pearls, they converted the chalices into drinking cups. Their tables, on which they gamed and feasted, were covered with the pictures of Christ and the saints. And they trampled underfoot the most venerable objects of the Christian worship. In the cathedral of St. Sophia, the ample veil of the sanctuary was rent asunder for the sake of the golden fringe, and the altar, a monument of art and riches, was broken in pieces and shared among the captors. Their mules and horses were laden with the wrought silver and gilt carvings which they tore down from the doors and pulpit, and if the beasts stumbled under the burden, they were stabbed by their impatient drivers, and the holy pavement streamed with their impure blood. A prostitute was seated on the throne of the patriarch, and that daughter of Belial, as she is styled, sung and danced in the church to ridicule the hymns and processions of the Orientals. Nor were the repositories of the royal dead secure from violation. In the church of the apostles, the tombs of the emperors were rifled, and it is said that after six centuries the corpse of Justinian was found without any signs of decay or putrefaction. In the streets the French and Flemings clothed themselves and their horses in painted robes and flowing headdresses of linen, and the coarse intemperance of their feasts insulted the splendid sobriety of the East. To expose the arms of a people of scribes and scholars, they affected to display a pen, an inkhorn, and a sheet of paper, without discerning that the instruments of science and valour were alike feeble and useless in the hands of the modern Greeks. Their reputation and their language encouraged them, however, to despise the ignorance and to overlook the progress of the Latins. In the love of the arts, the national difference was still more obvious and real. The Greeks preserved with reverence the works of their ancestors, which they could not imitate. And, in the destruction of the statues of Constantinople, we are provoked to join in the complaints and invectives of the Byzantine historian. We have seen how the rising city was adorned by the vanity and despotism of the imperial founder. In the ruins of paganism, some gods and heroes were saved from the acts of superstition, and the Forum and Hippodrome were dignified with the relics of a better age. Several of these are described by Nicetus in a florid and affected style, and from his descriptions I shall select some interesting particulars. 1. The victorious charioteers were cast in bronze, at their own or the public charge and fitly placed in the hippodrome. They stood aloft in their chariots, wheeling round the goal. The spectators could admire their attitude and judge of the resemblance, and of these figures the most perfect might have been transported from the Olympic stadium. 2. The sphinx, river horse, and crocodile denote the climate and manufacture of Egypt and the spoils of that ancient province. 3. The she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus, a subject alike pleasing to the old and the new Romans, but which could rarely be treated before the decline of the Greek sculpture. 4. An eagle holding and tearing a serpent in his talons, 
a domestic monument of the Byzantines, which they ascribed not to a human artist, but to the magic power of the philosopher Apollonius, who by this talisman delivered the city from such venomous reptiles. 5. An ass and his driver, which were erected by Augustus in his colony of Nicopolis, to commemorate a verbal omen of the victory of Actium. 6. An equestrian statue, which passed in the vulgar opinion for Joshua, the Jewish conqueror, stretching out his hand to stop the course of the descending sun. A more classical tradition recognised the figures of Bellerophon and Pegasus, and the free attitude of the steed seemed to mark that he trod on air rather than on the earth. 7. A square and lofty obelisk of brass. The sides were embossed with a variety of picturesque and rural scenes. Birds singing, rustics labouring or playing on their pipes, sheep bleating, lambs skipping, the sea, and a scene of fish and fishing, little naked cupids laughing, playing, and pelting each other with apples, and on the summit a female figure turning with the slightest breath, and thence denominated the wind's attendant. 8. The Phrygian shepherd presenting to Venus the prize of beauty, the apple of discord. 9. The incomparable statue of Helen, which is delineated by Nicetus in the words of admiration and love. Her well-turned feet, snowy arms, rosy lips, bewitching smiles, swimming eyes, arched eyebrows, the harmony of her shape, the lightness of her drapery, and her flowing locks that waved in the wind, a beauty that might have moved her barbarian destroyers to pity and remorse. 10. The manly, or divine, form of Hercules, as he was restored to life by the master hand of Lysippus, of such magnitude that his thumb was equal to the waist, his leg to the stature of a common man. His chest ample, his shoulders broad, his limbs strong and muscular, his hair curled, his aspect commanding. Without his bow, or quiver, or club, his lion's skin carelessly thrown over him, he was seated on an osier basket, his right leg and arm stretched to the out utmost, his left knee bent and supporting his elbow, his head reclining on his left hand, his countenance indignant and pensive. 11. A colossal statue of Juno, which had once adorned her temple of Samos, the enormous head by four yoke of oxen was laboriously drawn to the palace. 12. Another colossus of Pallas or Minerva, thirty feet in height, and representing with admirable spirit the attributes and character of the martial maid. Before we accuse the Latins, it is just to remark that this palace was destroyed after the first siege by the fear and superstition of the Greeks themselves. The other statues of brass which I have enumerated were broken and melted by the unfeeling avarice of the Crusaders. The cost and labour were consumed in a moment, the soul of genius evaporated in smoke, and the remnant of base metal was coined into money for the payment of the troops. Bronze is not the most durable of monuments. From the marble forms of Phidias and Praxiteles, the Latins might turn aside with stupid contempt. But unless they were crushed by some accidental injury, those useless stones stood secure on their pedestals. The most enlightened of the strangers, above the gross and sensual pursuits of their countrymen, more piously exercised the right of conquest in the search and seizure of the relics of the saints. Immense was the supply of heads and bones, crosses and images, that were scattered by this revolution over the churches of Europe. And such was the increase of pilgrimage and oblation, that no branch, perhaps, of more lucrative plunder was imported from the East. Of the writings of antiquity, many that still existed in the twelfth century are now lost. But the pilgrims were not solicitous 
to save or transport the volumes of an unknown tongue. The perishable subsidence of paper or parchment can only be preserved by the multiplicity of copies. The literature of the Greeks had almost centred in the metropolis, and, without computing the extent of our loss, we may drop a tear over the libraries that have perished in the triple fire of Constantinople. End of chapter 60, part 3「The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 6, Chapter 61, Part 1. Chapter 61, Partition of the Empire by the French and Venetians, Part 1. Partition of the Empire by the French and Venetians. Five Latin emperors of the, Ro of the houses of Flanders and Courtenay, their wars against the Bulgarians and Greeks, Weakness and Poverty of the Latin Empire, Recovery of Constantinople by the Greeks, General Consequences of the Crusades. After the death of the lawful princes, the French and Venetians, confident of justice and victory, agreed to divide and regulate their future possessions. It was stipulated by treaty that twelve electors, six of either nation, should be nominated, that a majority should choose the Emperor of the East, and that if the votes were equal, the decision of chance should ascertain the successful candidate. To him, with all the titles and prerogatives of the Byzantine throne, they assigned the two palaces of Bocoleon and Blasheron, with a fourth part of the Greek monarchy. It was defined that the three remaining portions should be equally shared between the Republic of Venice and the barons of France, that each feudatory, with an honorable exception for the doge, should acknowledge and perform the duties of homage and military service to the supreme head of the empire, that the nation which gave an emperor should resign to their brethren the choice of a patriarch, and that the pilgrims, whatever might be their impatience to visit the Holy Land, should devote another year to the conquest and defense of the Greek provinces. After the conquest of Constantinople by the Latins, the treaty was confirmed and executed and the first and most important step was the creation of an emperor. The six electors of the French nation were all ecclesiastics, the abbot of Loches, the archbishop-elect of Acre in Palestine, and the bishops of Troyes, Soissons, Halberstadt, and Bethlehem, the last of whom exercised in the camp the office of Pope's legate. Their profession and knowledge were respectable, and as they could not be the objects, they were best qualified to be the authors of the choice. The six Venetians were the principal servants of the state, and in this list the noble families of Quirini and Contarini are still proud to discover their ancestors. The twelve assembled in the chapel of the palace, and after the solemn invocation of the Holy Ghost, they proceeded to deliberate and vote. A just impulse of respect and gratitude prompted them to crown the virtues of the doge. 
his wisdom had inspired their enterprise, and the most useful knights might envy and applaud the exploits of blindness and age. But the patriot Dandolo was devoid of all personal ambition and fully satisfied that he had been judged worthy to reign. His nomination was overruled by the Venetians themselves. His countrymen and perhaps his friends represented with the eloquence of truth the mischiefs that might arise to national freedom and the common cause from the union of two incompatible characters of the first magistrate of a republic and the emperor of the east. The exclusion of the doge left room for the more equal merits of Boniface and Baldwin, and at their names all meaner candidates respectfully withdrew. The Marquis of Montferrat was recommended by his mature age and fair reputation by the choice of the adventurers and the wishes of the Greeks. Nor can I believe that Venice, the mistress of the sea, could be seriously apprehensive of a petty lord at the foot of the Alps. But the Count of Flanders was a chief of a wealthy and warlike people. He was valiant, pious, and chaste. In the prime of life, since he was only thirty-two years of age, a descendant of Charlemagne, a cousin of the King of France, and a composer of the prelates and barons who had yielded with reluctance to the command of a foreigner. Without the chapel, these barons, with a doge and marquis at their head, expected the decision of the twelve electors. It was announced by the Bishop of Soissons, in the name of his colleagues, Ye have sworn to obey the prince whom we should choose. By our unanimous suffrage, Baldwin, Count of Flanders, and Hainault is now your sovereign and the Emperor of the East. He was saluted with loud applause, and the proclamation was re-echoed through the city by the joy of the Latins and the trembling adulation of the Greeks. Boniface was the first to kiss the hand of his rival and to raise him on the buckler, and Baldwin was transported to the cathedral and solemnly invested with the purple buskins. At the end of three weeks he was crowned by the legate in the vacancy of the patriarch, but the Venetian clergy soon filled the chapter of St. Sophia, seated Thomas Morosini on the ecclesiastical throne, and employed Ariat to perpetuate in their own nation the honors and benefices of the Greek Church. Without delay, the successor of Constantine instructed Palestine, France, and Rome of this memorable revolution. To Palestine he sent as a trophy the gates of Constantinople and the chain of the harbor, and adopted from the Assis of Jerusalem the laws or customs best adapted to a French colony and conquest in the east. In his epistles, the natives of France are encouraged to swell that colony and to secure that conquest, to people a magnificent city and a fertile land which will reward the labors both of the priest and the soldier. He congratulates the Roman pontiff on the restoration of his authority in the east invites him to extinguish the Greek schism by his presence in a general council, and employs his blessing and forgiveness for the disobedient pilgrims. Prudence and dignity are blended in the answer of the innocent. In the subversion of the Byzantine Empire, he arraigns the vices of man and adores the providence of God. The conquerors will be absolved or condemned by their future conduct. 
the validity of their treaty depends on the judgment of St. Peter, but he inculcates their most sacred duty of establishing a just subordination of obedience and tribute from the Greeks to the Latins, from the magistrate to the clergy, and from the clergy to the Pope. In the division of the Greek provinces, the share of the Venetians was more ample than that of the Latin emperor. No more than one-fourth was appropriated to his domain. A clear moiety of the remainder was reserved for Venice, and the other moiety was distributed among the adventures of France and Lombardy. The venerable Dandolo was proclaimed despot of Romania and invested after the Greek fashion with the purple buskins. He ended at Constantinople his long and glorious life, and if the prerogative was personal, the title was used by his successors till the middle of the 14th century with a singular though true addition of lords of one-fourth and a half of the Roman Empire. The doge, a slave of state, was seldom permitted to depart from the helm of the republic, but his place was supplied by the bail or regent, who exercised a supreme jurisdiction over the colony of Venetians. They possessed three of the eight quarters of the city, and his independent tribunal was composed of six judges, four councillors, two chamberlains, two fiscal advocates, and a constable. Their long experience of the eastern trade enabled them to select their portion with discernment. They had rashly accepted the dominion and defense of Adrianople, but it was the more reasonable aim of their policy to form a chain of factories and cities and islands along the maritime coast from the neighborhood of Ragusa to the Hellespont and the Bosphorus. The labor and cost of such extensive conquests exhausted their treasury. They abandoned their maxims of government, adopted a feudal system, and contented themselves with the homage of their nobles for the possessions which these private vassals undertook to reduce and maintain. And thus it was that the family of Sanut acquired the duchy of Naxos, which involved the greatest part of the archipelago. For the price of 10,000 marks, the republic purchased of the Marquis of Montferrat the fertile island of Crete or Candia with the ruins of a hundred cities, but its improvement was tinted by the proud and narrow spirit of an aristocracy, and the wisest senators would confess that the sea, not the land, was the treasury of St. Mark. In the moiety of the adventurers, the Marquis Boniface might claim the most liberal reward, and besides the island of Crete, his exclusion from the throne was compensated by the royal title and the provinces beyond the Hellespont. But he prudently exchanged that distant and difficult conquest for the kingdom of Thessalonica, Macedonia, twelve days' journey from the capital, where he might be supported by the neighboring powers of his brother-in-law, the King of Hungary. His progress was hailed by the voluntary or reluctant acclamations of the natives, and Greece, the proper and ancient Greece, again received a Latin conqueror who trod with indifference that classic ground. He viewed with a careless eye the beauties of the valley of Tempe, traversed with a cautious step the Straits of Thermopylae, occupied the unknown cities of Thebes, Athens, and Argos, and assaulted the fortifications of Corinth and Napoli, which resisted his arms. 
The lots of the Latin pilgrims were regulated by chance or choice or subsequent exchange, and they abused with intemperate joy their triumph over the lives and fortunes of a great people. After a minute survey of the provinces, they weighed in the scales of avarice, the revenue of each district, the advantage of the situation, and the ample or scanty supplies for the maintenance of soldiers and horses. Their presumption claimed and divided the long-lost dependencies of the Roman scepter. The Nile and Euphrates rolled through their imaginary realms, and happy was the warrior who drew for his prize the palace of the Turkish Sultan of Iconium. I shall not descend to the pedigree of families and the rent roll of estates, but I wish to specify that the Counts of Blois and St. Paul were invested with the Duchy of Nice and the Lordship of De Monica. The principal fiefs were held by the service of Constable, Chamberlain, Cupbearer, Butler, and Chief Cook, and our historian, Geoffrey of Villa Hardwin, obtained a fair establishment on the banks of the Hebrus and united the double office of Marshal of Champagne and Romania. At the head of his knights and archers, each baron mounted on horseback to secure the possession of his share, and their first efforts were generally successful. But the public force was weakened by their dispersion, and a thousand quarrels must arise under a law and among men whose sole umpire was the sword. Within three months after the conquest of Constantinople, the emperor and the king of Thessalonica drew their hostile followers into the field. They were reconciled by the authority of the doge, the advice of the marshal, and the firm freedom of their peers. Note. William de Champlain, brother of the Count of Dijon, assumed the title of Prince of Ikea on the death of his brother. He returned with a regret to France to assume his paternal inheritance and left Villahadouin his bailli on condition that if he did not return within a year, Villahadouin was to retain an investiture. Brossette's addendum to the Le Beau volume, 16, page 200. M. Brossette adds, From the Greek chronicler edited by M. Bouchon, the somewhat unknightly trick by which Villain Hardwin disembarrassed himself from the troublesome claim of Robert, the cousin of the Count of Dijon, to the succession. He contrived that Robert should arrive just fifteen days too late, and with the general concurrence of the assembled knights, was himself invested with a principality. Two fugitives who had reigned at Constantinople still asserted the title of emperor, and the subjects of their fallen throne might be moved to pity by the misfortune of the elder Alexius, or excited to revenge by the spirit of Musuf, a domestic alliance, a common interest, a similar guilt, and the merit of extinguishing his enemies, a brother and a nephew, induced the more recent usurper to unite with the former the relics of his power. Musuf was received with smiles and honors in the camp of his father Alexius, but the wicked can never love and should rarely trust their fellow criminals. He was seized in the bath, deprived of his eyes, stripped of his troops and treasures, and turned out to wander an object of horror and contempt to those who with more propriety could hate and with more justice could punish the assassin of the emperor Isaac and his son. As the tyrant pursued by fear or remorse was stealing over to Asia, 
he was seized by the Latins of Constantinople and condemned, after an open trial, to an ignominious death. His judges debated the mode of his execution, the axe, the wheel, or the stake, and it was resolved that Mursuf should ascend the Theodosian column, a pillar of white marble of 147 feet in height. From the summit he was cast down headlong and dashed in pieces on the pavement in the presence of innumerable, innumerable spectators who filled the form the Forum of Taurus, and admired the accomplishment of an old prediction which was explained by this singular event. The fate of Alexius is less tragical. He was sent by the Marquis a captive to Italy and a gift to the King of the Romans, but he had not much to applaud his fortune if the sentence of imprisonment and exile were changed from a fortress in the Alps to a monastery in Asia. But his daughter, before the national calamity, had been given in marriage to a young hero who continued the succession and restored the throne of the Greek princes. The valor of Theodore Lecaris was signalized in the two sieges of Constantinople. After the flight of Morsuf, when the Latins were already in the city, he offered himself as their emperor to the soldiers and people, and his ambition, which might be virtuous, was undoubtedly brave. Could he have infused a soul into the multitude, they might have crushed the strangers under their feet. Their abject despair refused his aid, and Theodore retired to breathe the air of freedom in Anatolia beyond the immediate view and pursuit of the conquerors. Under the title at first of despot and afterwards of emperor, he drew to his standard the bolder spirits who were fortified against slavery by the contempt of life, and as every means was lawful for the public safety, implored without scruple the alliance of the Turkish Sultan Nice, where Theodore established his residence, Prusa and Philadelphia, Smyrna and Ephesus, opened their gates to their deliverer. He derived strength and reputation from his victories, and even from his defeats, and the successor of Constantine preserved a fragrant a fragment of the empire from the banks of the Manda to the suburbs of Nicomedia and at length of Constantinople. Another portion, distant and obscure, was possessed by the lineal heir of the Comini, a son of the virtuous Manuel, a grandson of the tyrant Andronicus, his name was Alexius, and the epithet of great was applied perhaps to his stature rather than to his exploits. By the indulgence of the Angeli, he was appointed governor or duke of Trebizond. His birth gave him ambition, the revolution independence, and without changing his title, he reigned in peace from Sinope to the Phasis along the coast of the Black Sea. His nameless son and successor is described as the vassal of the Sultan, whom he served with two hundred lances. That Comenian prince was no more than Duke of Trebizond, and the title of Emperor was first assumed by the pride and envy of the grandson of Alexius. In the West, a third fragment was saved from the common shipwreck by Michael, a bastard of the House of Angeli, who before the Revolution had been known as a hostage, a soldier, and a rebel. His flight from the camp of the Marquis Boniface secured his freedom. By his marriage with the governor's daughter, he commanded the important place 
of Durazzo assumed the title of despot and founded a strong and conspicuous principality in Epirus, Aetolia, and Thessaly, which have ever been peopled by a warlike race. The Greeks, who had offered their service to their new sovereigns, were excluded by the haughty Latins from all civil and military honors as a nation born to tremble and obey. Their resentment prompted them to show that they might have been useful friends since they could be dangerous enemies. Their nerves were braced by adversity. Whatever was learned or holy, whatever was noble or valiant, rolled away into the independent states of Trebizond, Epirus, and Nice. And a single patrician is marked by the ambiguous praise of attachment and loyalty to the Franks. The vulgar herd of the cities and the country would have gladly submitted to a mild and regular servitude, and the transient disorders of war would have been obliterated by some years of industry and peace. But peace was banished and industry was crushed in the disorders of the feudal system. The Roman emperors of Constantinople if they were endowed with abilities, were armed with power for the protection of their subjects, their laws were wise, and their administration was simple. The Latin throne was filled by a titular prince, the chief, and often the servant, of his licentious confederates, the fiefs of the empire, from a kingdom to a castle, were held and ruled by the sword of the barons, and their discord, poverty, and ignorance extended the ramifications of tyranny to the most sequestered villages. The Greeks were oppressed by the double weight of the priest, who were invested with temporal power, and of the soldier, who was inflamed by fanatic hatred, and the insuperable bar of religion and language forever separated the stranger and the native. As long as the crusaders were united at Constantinople, the memory of their conquest and the terror of their arms imposed silence on the captive land. Their dispersion betrayed the smallness of their numbers and the defects of their discipline, and some failures and mischances revealed the secret that they were not invincible. As the fears of the Greeks abated, their hatred increased. They murdered, they conspired, and before a year of slavery had elapsed, they implored or accepted the succor of a barbarian whose power they had felt and whose gratitude they trusted. The Latin conquerors had been saluted with a solemn and early embassy from John, or Johannes, or Calojohn, the revolted chief of the Bulgarians and Wallachians. He deemed himself their brother as the votary of the Roman pontiff from whom he had received the regal title and a holy banner, and in the subversion of the Greek monarchy he might aspire to the name of their friend and accomplice. But Carlo John was astonished to find that the Count of Flanders had assumed the pomp and pride of the successors of Constantine, and his ambassadors were dismissed with a haughty message that the rebel must deserve a pardon by touching with his forehead the footstool of the imperial throne. His resentment would have exhaled in acts of violence and blood. His cooler policy watched the rising discontent of the Greeks, affected a tender concern for their sufferings, and promised that their first struggles for freedom should be supported by his person and kingdom. The conspiracy was propagated by national hatred, the firmest ban of association and secrecy. The Greeks were impatient to sheathe their daggers in the breasts of the victorious strangers, but the execution was prudently delayed till Henry, the emperor, a brother, 
had transported the flower of his troops beyond the Hellespont. Most of the towns and villages of Thrace were true to the moment and the signal, and the Latins, without arms or suspicion, were slaughtered by the vile and merciless revenge of their slaves. From Demotica, the first scene of the massacre, the surviving vassals of the Count of St. Paul escaped to Adrianople, but the French and Venetians who occupied that city were slain or expelled by the furious multitude. The garrisons that could have effect their retreat fell back on each other towards the metropolis, and the fortresses that separate, separately stood against the rebels were ignorant of each other's and of their sovereign's fate. The voice of fame and fear announced the revolt of the Greeks and the rapid approach of their Bulgarian ally, and Callow John, not depending on the forces of his own kingdom, had drawn from the Scythian wilderness a body of 14,000 comans who drank, as it, it was said, the blood of their captives and sacrificed the Christians on the altars of their gods. Alarmed by this sudden and growing danger, the emperor dispatched a swift messenger to recall Count Henry and his troops and had Baldwin expected the return of his gallant brother with a supply of 20,000 Armenians, he might have encountered the invader with equal numbers and a decisive superiority of arms and discipline. But the spirit of chivalry could seldom discriminate caution from cowardice, and the emperor took the field with a hundred and forty knights and their train of archers and sergeants. The marshal who dissuaded and obeyed led the vanguard in their march to Adrianople. The main body was commanded by the Count of Blois. The aged Doge of Venice followed with the rear, and their scanty numbers were increased from all sides by the fugitive Latins. They undertook to besiege the rebels of Adrianople, and such was the pious tendency of the Crusades that they employed the Holy Week in pillaging the country for their subsistence and in framing engines for the destruction of their fellow Christians. But the Latins were soon interrupted and alarmed by the light cavalry of the Comans, who boldly skirmished to the edge of their imperfect lines, and a proclamation was issued by the Marshal of Romania that, on the trumpet sound, the cavalry should mount and form, but that none, under pain of death, should abandon themselves to a desultory and dangerous pursuit. This wise injunction was first disobeyed by the Count of Blois, who involved the Emperor in his rashness and ruin. The Comans of the Parthian or Tartar school fled before their first charge, but after a career of two leagues, when the knights and their horses were almost breathless, they suddenly turned, rallied, and encompassed the heavy squadrons of the Franks. The count was slain on the field, the emperor was made prisoner, and if the one disdained to fly, if the other refused to yield, their personal bravery made a poor atonement for their ignorance or neglect of the duties of a general. Note. Gibbon appears to me to have misapprehended the passage of Nicetas. He says that principal and subtlest mischief, that primary cause of all horrible miseries suffered by the Romans, that is, the Byzantines, it is an effusion of malicious triumph against the Venetians, to whom he always ascribed the capture of Constantinople. End of chapter 61, part 1. Recording by Dick Durrett, Manchester, New Hampshire, USA.
Part Two of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Sixty One. Part two. Proud of his victory and his royal prize, the Bulgarian advanced to relieve Adrianople and achieve the destruction of the Latins. They must inevitably have been destroyed if the Marshal of Romania had not displayed a cool courage and consummate skill, uncommon in all ages, but most uncommon in those times, when war was a passion rather than a science. His grief and fears were poured into the firm and faithful bosom of the doge, but in the camp he diffused an assurance of safety which could only be realised by the general belief. All day he maintained his perilous station between the city and the barbarians. Veladouin decamped in silence at the dead of night, and his masterly retreat of three days would have deserved the praise of Xenophon and the Ten Thousand. In the rear, the marshal supported the weight of the pursuit. In the front, he moderated the impatience of the fugitives, and wherever the comans approached, they were repelled by a line of impenetrable spears. On the third day, the weary troops beheld the sea, the solitary town of Redosta, and their friends, who had landed from the Asiatic shore. They embraced, they wept, but they united their arms and councils and in his brother's absence, Count Henry assumed the regency of the empire, at once in a state of childhood and caducity. If the Comans withdrew from the summer heats, seven thousand Latins, in the hour of danger, deserted Constantinople, their brethren, and their vows. Some partial success was overbalanced by the loss of one hundred and twenty knights in the field of Rusium, and of the imperial domain, no more was left than the capital, with two or three adjacent fortresses on the shores of Europe and Asia. The king of Bulgaria was resistless and inexorable, and Calo John respectfully eluded the demands of the pope, who conjured his new proselyte to restore peace and the emperor to the afflicted Latins. The deliverance of Baldwin was no longer, he said, in the power of man. That prince had died in prison, and the manner of his death is variously related by ignorance and credulity. The lovers of a tragic legend will be pleased to hear that the royal captive was tempted by the amorous queen of the Bulgarians, that his chaste refusal exposed him to the falsehood of a woman and the jealousy of a savage, that his hands and feet were severed from his body, that his bleeding trunk was cast among the carcasses of dogs and horses, and that he breathed three days before he was devoured by the birds of prey. About twenty years afterwards, in a wood of the Netherlands, a hermit announced himself as the true Baldwin, the emperor of Constantinople, and lawful sovereign of Flanders. He related the wonders of his escape, his adventures, and his penance, among a people prone to believe and to rebel, and, in the first transport, Flanders acknowledged her long-lost sovereign. A short examination before the French court detected the impostor, who was punished with an ignominious death, but the Fleming still adhered to the pleasing error, and the Countess Jane is accused by the gravest historians of sacrificing to her ambition the life of an unfortunate father. In all civilised hostility, a treaty is established for the exchange or ransom of prisoners, and if their captivity be prolonged, their condition is known, and they are treated according to their rank with humanity or honour. But the savage Bulgarian was a stranger to the laws of war. His prisons were involved in darkness and silence and above a year elapsed before the Latins could be assured of the death of Baldwin. 
before his brother, the regent Henry, would consent to assume the title of emperor. His moderation was applauded by the Greeks as an act of rare and inimitable virtue. Their light and perfidious ambition was eager to seize or anticipate the moment of a vacancy, while a law of succession, the guardian both of the prince and people, was gradually defined and confirmed in the hereditary monarchies of Europe. In the support of the Eastern Empire, Henry was gradually left without an associate, as the heroes of the crusade retired from the world or from the war. The doge of Venice, the venerable Dandolo, in the fullness of years and glory, sunk into the grave. The Marquis of Montferrat was slowly recalled from the Peloponnesian War to the revenge of Baldwin and the defence of Thessalonica. Some nice disputes of feudal homage and service were reconciled in a personal interview between the emperor and the king. They were firmly united by mutual esteem and the common danger, and their alliance was sealed by the nuptials of Henry with the daughter of the Italian prince. He soon deplored the loss of his friend and father. At the persuasion of some faithful Greeks, Boniface made a bold and successful inroad among the hills of Rodope. The Bulgarians fled on his approach. They assembled to harass his retreat. On the intelligence that his rear was attacked, without waiting for any defensive armour, he leaped on horseback, couched his lance, and drove the enemies before him. But in the rash pursuit he was pierced with a mortal wound, and the head of the king of Thessalonica was presented to Calo John, who enjoyed the honours without the merit of victory. It is here, at this melancholy event, that the pen or the voice of Geoffrey of Villardouin seems to drop or to expire, and if he still exercised his military office of Marshal of Romania, his subsequent exploits are buried in oblivion. The character of Henry was not unequal to his arduous situation. In the siege of Constantinople and beyond the Hellespont, he had deserved the fame of a valiant knight and a skilful commander, and his courage was tempered with a degree of prudence and mildness unknown to his impetuous brother. In the double war against the Greeks of Asia and the Bulgarians of Europe, he was ever the foremost on shipboard or on horseback, and though he cautiously provided for the success of his arms, the drooping Latins were often roused by his example to save and to second their fearless emperor. But such efforts and some supplies of men and money from France were of less avail than the errors the cruelty and death of their most formidable adversary. When the despair of the Greek subjects invited Calo John as their deliverer, they hoped that he would protect their liberty and adopt their laws. They were soon taught to compare the degrees of national ferocity and to execrate the savage conqueror who no longer dissembled his intention of dispeopling Thrace, of demolishing the cities, and of transplanting the inhabitants beyond the Danube. Many towns and villages of Thrace were already evacuated. A heap of ruins marked the place of Philippopolis, and a similar calamity was expected at Demotica and Adrianople by the first authors of the revolt. They raised a cry of grief and repentance to the throne of Henry. The emperor alone had the magnanimity to forgive and trust them. No more than four hundred knights, with their sergeants and archers, could be assembled under his banner. And with this slender force he fought and repulsed the Bulgarian, who, besides his infantry, was at the head of forty thousand horse. In this expedition Henry felt the difference between a hostile and a friendly country. The remaining cities were preserved by his arms, and the savage, with shame and loss, was compelled to relinquish his prey. The siege of Thessalonica was the last of the evils which Calo John inflicted or suffered. He was stabbed in the night in his tent, and the general, perhaps the assassin, 
who found him weltering in his blood, ascribed the blow with general applause to the lance of St. Demetrius. After several victories, the prudence of Henry concluded an honourable peace with the successor of the tyrant, and with the Greek princes of Nice and Epirus. If he ceded some doubtful limits, an ample kingdom was reserved for himself and his feudatories, and his reign, which lasted only ten years, afforded a short interval of prosperity and peace. Far above the narrow policy of Baldwin and Boniface, he freely entrusted to the Greeks the most important offices of the state and army, and this liberality of sentiment and practice was the more seasonable, as the princes of Nice and Epirus had already learned to seduce and employ the mercenary valour of the Latins. It was the aim of Henry to unite and reward his deserving subjects of every nation and language, but he appeared less solicitous to accomplish the impracticable union of the two churches. Pelagius, the Pope's legate, who acted as the sovereign of Constantinople, had interdicted the worship of the Greeks, and sternly imposed the payment of tithes, the double procession of the Holy Ghost, and a blind obedience to the Roman pontiff. As the weaker party, they pleaded the duties of conscience, and implored the rights of toleration. Our bodies, they said, are Caesar's, but our souls belong only to God. The persecution was checked by the firmness of the emperor, and if we can believe that the same prince was poisoned by the Greeks themselves, we must entertain a contemptible idea of the sense and gratitude of mankind. His valour was a vulgar attribute, which he shared with ten thousand knights, but Henry possessed the superior courage to oppose, in a superstitious age, the pride and avarice of the clergy. In the cathedral of St. Sophia, he presumed to place his throne on the right hand of the patriarch, and this presumption excited the sharpest censure of Pope Innocent III. By a salutary edict, one of the first examples of the laws of Mortmain, he prohibited the alienation of fiefs. Many of the Latins, desirous of returning to Europe, resigned their estates to the church for a spiritual or temporal reward. These holy lands were immediately discharged from military service, and a colony of soldiers would have been gradually transformed into a college of priests. The virtuous Henry died at Thessalonica, in the defence of that kingdom, and of an infant, the son of his friend Boniface. In the two first emperors of Constantinople, the male line of the Counts of Flanders was extinct, but their sister Yolande was the wife of a French prince, the mother of a numerous progeny, and one of her daughters had married Andrew, king of Hungary, a brave and pious champion of the cross. By seating him on the Byzantine throne, the barons of Romania would have acquired the forces of a neighbouring and warlike kingdom, but the prudent Andrew revered the laws of succession, and the princess Yolande, with her husband Peter of Courtenay, Count of Auxerre, was invited by the Latins to assume the empire of the East. The royal birth of his father, the noble origin of his mother, recommended to the barons of France the first cousin of their king. His reputation was fair, his possessions were ample, and, in the bloody crusade against the Albigeois, the soldiers and priests had been abundantly satisfied of his zeal and valour. Vanity might applaud the elevation of a French emperor of Constantinople, but prudence must pity, rather than envy, his treacherous and imaginary greatness. To assert and adorn his title, he was reduced to sell or mortgage the best of his patrimony. By these expedients, the liberality of his royal kinsman Philip Augustus, and the national spirit of chivalry, he was enabled to pass the Alps at the head of 140 knights and 5,500 sergeants and archers. After some hesitation, Pope Honorius III was persuaded to crown the successor of Constantine. 
but he performed the ceremony in a church without the walls, lest he should seem to imply or to bestow any right of sovereignty over the ancient capital of the empire. The Venetians had engaged to transport Peter and his forces beyond the Adriatic, and the empress with her four children to the Byzantine palace, but they required, as the price of their service, that he should recover Durazzo from the despot of Epirus, Michael Angelus, or Comnenus, the first of his dynasty, had bequeathed the succession of his power and ambition to Theodore, his legitimate brother, who already threatened and invaded the establishments of the Latins. After discharging his debt by a fruitless assault, the emperor raised the siege to prosecute a long and perilous journey over land, from Durazzo to Thessalonica. He was soon lost in the mountains of Epirus. The passes were fortified his provisions exhausted, he was delayed and deceived by a treacherous negotiation, and, after Peter of Courtenay and the Roman legate had been arrested in a banquet, the French troops, without leaders or hopes, were eager to exchange their arms for the delusive promise of mercy and bread. The Vatican thundered, and the impious Theodore was threatened with the vengeance of earth and heaven but the captive emperor and his soldiers were forgotten, and the reproaches of the Pope are confined to the imprisonment of his legate. No sooner was he satisfied by the deliverance of the priest and a promise of spiritual obedience than he pardoned and protected the despot of Epirus. His peremptory commands suspended the ardour of the Venetians and the king of Hungary, and it was only by a natural or untimely death, that Peter of Courtney was released from his hopeless captivity. The long ignorance of his fate, and the presence of the lawful sovereign, of Yolande, his wife or widow, delayed the proclamation of a new emperor. Before her death, and in the midst of her grief, she was delivered of a son, who was named Baldwin, the last and most unfortunate of the Latin princes of Constantinople. His birth endeared him to the barons of Romania, but his childhood would have prolonged the troubles of a minority, and his claims were superseded by the elder claims of his brethren. The first of these, Philip of Courtenay, who derived from his mother the inheritance of Namur, had the wisdom to prefer the substance of a marquisate, to the shadow of an empire, and on his refusal, Robert, the second of the sons of Peter and Yolande, was called to the throne of Constantinople. Warned by his father's mischance, he pursued his slow and secure journey through Germany and along the Danube. A passage was opened by his sister's marriage with the king of Hungary, and the emperor Robert was crowned by the patriarch in the cathedral of St. Sophia, but his reign was an era of calamity and disgrace, and the colony, as it was styled, of New France, yielded on all sides to the Greeks of Nice and Epirus. After a victory, which he owed to his perfidy rather than his courage, Theodore Angelus entered the kingdom of Thessalonica, expelled the feeble Demetrius, the son of the Marquis Boniface, erected his standard on the walls of Adrianople, and added, by his vanity, a third or a fourth name to the list of rival emperors. The relics of the Asiatic province were swept away by John Vatikes, the son-in-law and successor of Theodore Lascaris, and who, in a triumphant reign of thirty-three years, displayed the virtues both of peace and war. Under his discipline, the swords of the French mercenaries were the most effectual instrument of his conquests, and their desertion from the service of their country was at once a symptom and a cause of the rising ascendant of the Greeks. By the construction of a fleet, he obtained the command of the Hellespont, reduced the islands of Lesbos and Rhodes, attacked the Venetians of Candia, and intercepted the rare and parsimonious succors of the West. Once, and once only, the Latin emperor sent an army against Vatikes, and in the defeat of that army, the veteran knights, the last of the original conquerors, 
were left on the field of battle. But the success of a foreign enemy was less painful to the pusillanimous Robert than the insolence of his Latin subjects, who confounded the weakness of the emperor and of the empire. His personal misfortunes will prove the anarchy of the government and the ferociousness of the times. The amorous youth had neglected his Greek bride, the daughter of Vatikes, to introduce into the palace a beautiful maid of a private, though noble, family of Artois, and her mother had been tempted by the lustre of the purple to forfeit her engagements with the gentleman of Burgundy. His love was converted into rage. He assembled his friends, forced the palace gates, threw the mother into the sea, and inhumanly cut off the nose and lips of the wife or concubine of the emperor. Instead of punishing the offender, the barons avowed and applauded the savage deed, which, as a prince and as a man, it was impossible that Robert should forgive. He escaped from the guilty city to implore the justice or compassion of the pope. The emperor was coolly exhorted to return to his station. Before he could obey, he sunk under the weight of grief, shame, and impotent resentment. It was only in the age of chivalry that valour could ascend from a private station to the thrones of Jerusalem and Constantinople. The titular kingdom of Jerusalem had devolved to Mary, the daughter of Isabella and Conrad of Montferrat and the granddaughter of Almeric, or Almeri. She was given to John of Brienne, of a noble family in Champagne, by the public voice and the judgment of Philip Augustus, who named him as the most worthy champion of the Holy Land. In the Fifth Crusade he led a hundred thousand Latins to the conquest of Egypt. By him the siege of Damietta was achieved, and the subsequent failure was justly ascribed to the pride and avarice of the legate. After the marriage of his daughter with Frederick the Second, he was provoked by the emperor's ingratitude to accept the command of the army of the church, and though advanced in life and despoiled of royalty, the sword and spirit of John of Brienne were still ready for the service of Christendom. In the seven years of his brother's reign, Baldwin of Courtenay had not emerged from a state of childhood, and the barons of Romania felt the strong necessity of placing the sceptre in the hands of a man and a hero. The veteran king of Jerusalem might have disdained the name and office of regent. They agreed to invest him for his life with the title and prerogatives of emperor, on the sole condition that Baldwin should marry his second daughter, and succeed at a mature age to the throne of Constantinople. The expectation, both of the Greeks and Latins, was kindled by the renown, the choice, and the presence of John of Brienne, and they admired his martial aspect, his green and vigorous age of more than fourscore years, and his size and stature, which surpassed the common measure of mankind. But avarice, and the love of ease, appear to have chilled the ardour of enterprise, his troops were disbanded, and two years rolled away without action or honour, till he was awakened by the dangerous alliance of Vatikes, Emperor of Nice, and of Azan, King of Bulgaria. They besieged Constantinople by sea and land, with an army of one hundred thousand men, and a fleet of three hundred ships of war, while the entire force of the Latin Emperor was reduced to one hundred and sixty knights, and a small addition of sergeants and archers. I tremble to relate that, instead of defending the city, the hero made a sally at the head of his cavalry, and that of forty-eight squadrons of the enemy, no more than three escaped from the edge of his invincible sword. Fired by his example, the infantry and the citizens boarded the vessels that anchored close to the walls, and twenty-five were dragged in triumph into the harbour of Constantinople. At the summons of the emperor, the vassals and allies, armed in her defence, broke through every obstacle that opposed their passage, and, in the succeeding year, obtained a second victory over the same enemies. By the rude poets of the age, John of Brienne is compared to Hector, Roland, and Judas Maccabeus, 
but their credit and his glory received some abatement from the silence of the Greeks. The empire was soon deprived of the last of her champions, and the dying monarch was ambitious to enter paradise in the habit of a Franciscan friar. In the double victory of John of Brienne, I cannot discover the name or exploits of his pupil Baldwin, who had attained the age of military service, and who succeeded to the imperial dignity on the decease of his adoptive father. The royal youth was employed on a commission more suitable to his temper. He was sent to visit the western courts, of the Pope more especially, and of the King of France, to excite their pity by the view of his innocence and distress, and to obtain some supplies of men or money for the relief of the sinking empire. He thrice repeated these mendicant visits, in which he seemed to prolong his stay and postpone his return. Of the five-and-twenty years of his reign, a greater number were spent abroad than at home, and in no place did the emperor deem himself less free and secure than in his native country and his capital. On some public occasions his vanity might be soothed by the title of Augustus, and by the honours of the purple, and at the general council of Lyon, when Frederick the Second was excommunicated and deposed, his oriental colleague was enthroned on the right hand of the Pope. But how often was the exile, the vagrant, the imperial beggar, humbled with scorn, insulted with pity, and degraded in his own eyes and those of the nations. In his first visit to England, he was stopped at Dover by a severe reprimand that he should presume, without leave, to enter an independent kingdom. After some delay, Baldwin, however, was permitted to pursue his journey, was entertained with cold civility, and thankfully departed with a present of seven hundred marks. From the avarice of Rome, he could only obtain the proclamation of a crusade and a treasure of indulgences, a coin whose currency was depreciated by too frequent and indiscriminate abuse. His birth and misfortunes recommended him to the generosity of his cousin Louis the Ninth, but the martial zeal of the saint was diverted from Constantinople to Egypt and Palestine and the public and private poverty of Baldwin was alleviated for a moment by the alienation of the Marquisate of Namur and the Lordship of Courtenay, the last remains of his inheritance. By such shameful or ruinous expedients, he once more returned to Romania with an army of thirty thousand soldiers, whose numbers were doubled in the apprehension of the Greeks. His first dispatches to France and England announced his victories and his hopes. He had reduced the country round the capital to the distance of three days' journey, and if he succeeded against an important, though nameless city, most probably Chioli, the frontier would be safe and the passage accessible. But these expectations, if Baldwin was sincere, quickly vanished like a dream. The troops and treasures of France melted away in his unskilful hands, and the throne of the Latin emperor was protected by a dishonourable alliance with the Turks and Comans. To secure the former, he consented to bestow his niece on the unbelieving sultan of Cogni. To please the latter, he complied with their pagan rites. A dog was sacrificed between the two armies and their contracting parties tasted each other's blood as a pledge of their fidelity. In the palace, or prison, of Constantinople, the successor of Augustus demolished the vacant houses for winter fuel, and stripped the lead from the churches for the daily expense of his family. Some usurious loans were dealt with a scanty hand by the merchants of Italy, and Philip, his son and heir, was pawned at Venice as the security for a debt. Thirst 
hunger, and nakedness are positive evils, but wealth is relative, and a prince who would be rich in a private station may be exposed by the increase of his wants to all the anxiety and bitterness of poverty. End of chapter 61, part 2part three of the history of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by andrew coleman the history of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume six by edward gibbon chapter sixty one Part three. But in this abject distress, the emperor and empire were still possessed of an ideal treasure, which drew its fantastic value from the superstition of the Christian world. The merit of the true cross was somewhat impaired by its frequent division, and a long captivity among the infidels might shed some suspicion on the fragments that were produced in the east and west but another relic of the passion was preserved in the imperial chapel of Constantinople, and the crown of thorns which had been placed on the head of Christ was equally precious and authentic. It had formerly been the practice of the Egyptian debtors to deposit, as a security, the mummies of their parents, and both their honour and religion were bound for the redemption of the pledge. In the same manner, and in the absence of the emperor, the barons of Romania borrowed the sum of 13,134 pieces of gold on the credit of the Holy Crown. They failed in the performance of their contract, and a rich Venetian, Nicholas Quirini, undertook to satisfy their impatient creditors on condition that the relic should be lodged at Venice to become his absolute property if it were not redeemed within a short and definite term. The barons apprised their sovereign of the hard treaty and impending loss, and as the empire could not afford a ransom of seven thousand pounds sterling, Baldwin was anxious to snatch the prize from the Venetians, and to vest it with more honour and emolument in the hands of the most Christian king. Yet the negotiation was attended with some delicacy. In the purchase of relics, the saint would have started at the guilt of simony. But if the mode of expression were changed, he might lawfully repay the debt, accept the gift, and acknowledge the obligation. His ambassadors, two Dominicans, were dispatched to Venice to redeem and receive the holy crown, which had escaped the dangers of the sea, and the galleys of Vatikis. On opening a wooden box, they recognized the seals of the doge and barons, which were applied on a shrine of silver, and within this shrine, the monument of the passion was enclosed in a golden vase. The reluctant Venetians yielded to justice and power. The Emperor Frederick granted a free and honorable passage, the court of France advanced as far as Troyes in Champagne to meet with devotion this inestimable relic. It was borne in triumph through Paris by the king himself, barefoot and in his shirt, and a free gift of ten thousand marks of silver reconciled Baldwin to his loss. The success of this transaction tempted the Latin emperor to offer with the same generosity the remaining furniture of his chapel a large and authentic portion of the true cross, the baby linen of the Son of God, the lance, the sponge, and the chain of his passion, the rod of Moses, and part of the skull of St. John the Baptist. For the reception of these spiritual treasures, twenty thousand marks were expended by St. Louis on a stately foundation, 
the holy chapel of Paris, on which the muse of Boileau has bestowed a comic immortality. The truth of such remote and ancient relics, which cannot be proved by any human testimony, must be admitted by those who believe in the miracles which they have performed. About the middle of the last age, an inveterate ulcer was touched and cured by a holy prickle of the holy crown. The prodigy is attested by the most pious and enlightened Christians of France. Nor will the fact be easily disproved, except by those who are armed with the general antidote against religious credulity. The Latins of Constantinople were on all sides encompassed and pressed. Their sole hope, the last delay of their ruin, was in the division of their Greek and Bulgarian enemies, and of this hope they were deprived by the superior arms and policy of Vatikes, Emperor of Nice. From the Propontis to the rocky coast of Pamphylia, Asia was peaceful and prosperous under his reign, and the events of every campaign extended his influence in Europe. The strong cities of the hills of Macedonia and Thrace were rescued from the Bulgarians, and their kingdom was circumscribed by its present and proper limits along the southern banks of the Danube. The sole emperor of the Romans could no longer brook that a lord of Epirus, a Comnenian prince of the west, should presume to dispute or share the honours of the purple, and the humble Demetrius changed the colour of his buskins, and accepted with gratitude the appellation of despot. His own subjects were exasperated by his baseness and incapacity. They implored the protection of their supreme lord. After some resistance, the kingdom of Thessalonica was united to the empire of Nice, and Vatikes reigned without a competitor from the Turkish borders to the Adriatic Gulf. The princes of Europe revered his merit and power, and had he subscribed an orthodox creed, it should seem that the Pope would have abandoned without reluctance the Latin throne of Constantinople. But the death of Vatikes, the short and busy reign of Theodore his son, and the helpless infancy of his grandson John, suspended the restoration of the Greeks. In the next chapter I shall explain the domestic revolutions. In this place, it will be sufficient to observe that the young prince was oppressed by the ambition of his guardian and colleague, Michael Paleologus, who displayed the virtues and vices that belong to the founder of a new dynasty. The Emperor Baldwin had flattered himself that he might recover some provinces or cities by an impotent negotiation. His ambassadors were dismissed from Nice with mockery and contempt. At every place which they named, Paleologus alleged some special reason which rendered it dear and valuable in his eyes. In the one he was born, in another he had been first promoted to military command, and in a third he had enjoyed, and hoped long to enjoy, the pleasures of the chase. "'And what then do you propose to give us?' said the astonished deputies. "'Nothing,' replied the Greek. "'Not a foot of land.' If your master be desirous of peace, let him pay me, as an annual tribute, the sum which he receives from the trade and customs of Constantinople. On these terms I may allow him to reign. If he refuses, it is war. I am not ignorant of the art of war, and I trust the event to God and my sword. An expedition against the despot of Epirus was the first prelude of his arms. If a victory was followed by a defeat, if the race of the Komneni or Angeli survived in those mountains his efforts and his reign, the captivity of Villardouin, Prince of Achaea, deprived the Latins of the most active and powerful vassal of their expiring monarchy. The republics of Venice and Genoa disputed in the first of their naval wars the command of the sea and the commerce of the east. Pride and interest attached the Venetians to the defence of Constantinople. Their rivals were tempted to promote the designs of their enemies, and the alliance of the Genoese with the schismatic conqueror provoked the indignation of the Latin church. Intent on his great object, the Emperor Michael visited in person and strengthened the troops and fortifications of Thrace. The remains of the Latins were driven from their last possessions, 
he assaulted without success the suburb of Galata, and corresponded with a perfidious baron, who proved unwilling or unable to open the gates of the metropolis. The next spring his favourite general, Alexius Strategopolis, whom he had decorated with the title of Caesar, passed the Hellespont with eight hundred horse and some infantry on a secret expedition. His instructions enjoined him to approach, to listen, to watch, but not to risk any doubtful or dangerous enterprise against the city. The adjacent territory between the Propontis and the Black Sea was cultivated by a hardy race of peasants and outlaws, exercised in arms, uncertain in their allegiance, but inclined by language, religion, and present advantage to the party of the Greeks. They were styled the volunteers, and by their free service the army of Alexius, with the regulars of Thrace and the Coman auxiliaries, was augmented to the number of five and twenty thousand men. By the ardour of the volunteers, and by his own ambition, the Caesar was stimulated to disobey the precise orders of his master, in the just confidence that success would plead his pardon and reward. The weakness of Constantinople, and the distress and terror of the Latins, were familiar to the observation of the volunteers, and they represented the present moment as the most propitious to surprise and conquest. A rash youth, the new governor of the Venetian colony, had sailed away with thirty galleys and the best of the French knights on a wild expedition to Daphnusia, a town on the Black Sea, at the distance of forty leagues, and the remaining Latins were without strength or suspicion. They were informed that Alexius had passed the Hellespont, but their apprehensions were lulled by the smallness of his original numbers, and their imprudence had not watched the subsequent increase of his army. If he left his main body to second and support his operations, he might advance unperceived in the night with a chosen detachment. While some applied scaling ladders to the lowest part of the walls, they were secure of an old Greek who would introduce their companions through a subterraneous passage into his house. They could soon on the inside break an entrance through the golden gate, which had been long obstructed, and the conqueror would be in the heart of the city before the Latins were conscious of their danger. After some debate, the Caesar resigned himself to the faith of the volunteers. They were trusty, bold, and successful, and in describing the plan I have already related the execution and success. But no sooner had Alexius passed the threshold of the Golden Gate than he trembled at his own rashness, he paused, he deliberated, till the desperate volunteers urged him forwards by the assurance that in retreat lay the greatest and most inevitable danger. Whilst the Caesar kept his regulars in firm array, the Comans dispersed themselves on all sides, an alarm was sounded, and the threats of fire and pillage compelled the citizens to a decisive resolution. The Greeks of Constantinople remembered their native sovereigns, the Genoese merchants, their recent alliance and Venetian foes. Every quarter was in arms, and the air resounded with a general acclamation of Long life and victory to Michael and John, the august emperors of the Romans. Their rival, Baldwin, was awakened by the sound, but the most pressing danger could not prompt him to draw his sword in the defence of a city which he deserted perhaps with more pleasure than regret. He fled from the palace to the seashore, where he descried the welcome sails of the fleet returning from the vain and fruitless attempt on Daphnusia. Constantinople was irrecoverably lost, but the Latin emperor and the principal families embarked on board the Venetian galleys and steered for the isle of Euboea, and afterwards for Italy, where the royal fugitive was entertained by the Pope and Sicilian king with a mixture of contempt and pity. From the loss of Constantinople to his death, he consumed thirteen years soliciting the Catholic powers to join in his restoration. The lesson had been familiar to his youth, nor was his last exile more indigent or shameful than his three former pilgrimages to the courts of Europe. His son Philip was the heir of an ideal empire and the pretensions of his daughter, Catherine, were transported by her marriage to Charles of Valois, the brother of Philip the Fair, King of France. 
the house of Courtenay was represented in the female line by successive alliances, till the title of Emperor of Constantinople, too bulky and sonorous for a private name, modesty expired in silence and oblivion. After this narrative of the expeditions of the Latins to Palestine and Constantinople, I cannot dismiss the subject without revolving the general consequences on the countries that were the scene, and on the nations that were the actors, of these memorable crusades. As soon as the arms of the Franks were withdrawn, the impression, though not the memory, was erased in the Mohammedan realms of Egypt and Syria. The faithful disciples of the Prophet were never tempted by a profane desire to study the laws and languages of the idolaters, nor did the simplicity of their primitive manners receive the slightest alteration from their intercourse in peace and war with the unknown strangers of the West. The Greeks, who thought themselves proud, but who were only vain, showed a disposition somewhat less inflexible. In the efforts for the recovery of their empire, they emulated the valour, discipline, and tactics of their antagonists. The modern literature of the West they might justly despise, but its free spirit would instruct them in the rights of man, and some institutions of public and private life were adopted from the French. The correspondence of Constantinople and Italy diffused the knowledge of the Latin tongue, and several of the fathers and classics were at length honoured with a Greek version. But the national and religious prejudices of the Orientals were inflamed by persecution, and the reign of the Latins confirmed the separation of the two churches. If we compare the era of the Crusades, the Latins of Europe with the Greeks and Arabians, their respective degrees of knowledge, industry and art, our rude ancestors must be content with the third rank in the scale of nations. Their successive improvement and present superiority may be ascribed to a peculiar energy of character, to an active and imitative spirit, unknown to their more polished rivals, who at that time were in a stationary or retrograde state. With such a disposition, the Latins should have derived the most early and essential benefits from a series of events which opened their eyes the prospect of the world, and introduced them to a long and frequent intercourse with the more cultivated regions of the East. The first and most obvious progress was in trade and manufactures, in the arts which are strongly prompted by the thirst of wealth, the calls of necessity, and the gratification of the sense or vanity. Among the crowd of unthinking fanatics, a captive or a pilgrim might sometimes observe the superior refinements of Cairo and Constantinople. The first importer of windmills was the benefactor of nations, and if such blessings are enjoyed without any grateful remembrance, history has condescended to notice the more apparent luxuries of silk and sugar, which were transported into Italy from Greece and Egypt. But the intellectual wants of the Latins were more slowly felt and supplied. The ardour of studious curiosity was awakened in Europe by different causes and more recent events. And, in the age of the Crusaders, they viewed with careless indifference the literature of the Greeks and Arabians. Some rudiments of mathematical and medicinal knowledge might be imparted in practice and in figures. Necessity might produce some interpreters for the grosser business of merchants and soldiers. But the commerce of the Orientals had not diffused the study and knowledge of their languages in the schools of Europe. If a similar principle of religion repulsed the idiom of the Koran, it should have excited their patience and curiosity to understand the original text of the Gospel, and the same grammar would have unfolded the sense of Plato and the beauties of Homer. Yet, in a reign of sixty years, the Latins of Constantinople disdained the speech and learning of their subjects, and the manuscripts were the only treasures which the natives might enjoy without rapine or envy. 
Aristotle was indeed the oracle of the Western universities, but it was a barbarous Aristotle, and instead of ascending to the fountainhead, his Latin votaries humbly accepted a corrupt and remote version from the Jews and Moors of Andalusia. The principle of the Crusades was a savage fanaticism, and the most important effects were analogous to the cause each pilgrim was ambitious to return with his sacred spoils, the relics of Greece and Palestine, and each relic was preceded and followed by a train of miracles and visions. The belief of the Catholics was corrupted by new legends, their practice by new superstitions, and the establishment of the Inquisition, the mendicant orders of monks and friars, the last abuse of indulgences, and the final progress of idolatry flowed from the baleful fountain of the holy war. The active spirit of the Latins preyed on the vitals of their reason and religion, and if the ninth and tenth centuries were the times of darkness, the thirteenth and fourteenth were the age of absurdity and fable. End of chapter 61, part 3. Chapter 61, part 4 of The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andrew Coleman The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 6 Chapter 61 Partition of the Empire by the French and Venetians, Part 4 In the profession of Christianity, in the cultivation of a fertile land, the northern conquerors of the Roman Empire insensibly mingled with the provincials, and rekindled the embers of the arts of antiquity. Their settlements about the age of Charlemagne had acquired some degree of order and stability, when they were overwhelmed by new swarms of invaders, the Normans, Saracens, and Hungarians, who replunged the western countries of Europe into their former state of anarchy and barbarism. About the eleventh century, the second tempest had subsided by the expulsion or conversion of the enemies of Christendom. The tide of civilization, which had so long ebbed, began to flow with a steady and accelerated course and a fairer prospect was opened to the hopes and efforts of the rising generations. Great was the increase, and rapid the progress, during the two hundred years of the Crusades, and some philosophers have applauded the propitious influence of these holy wars, which appear to me to have checked, rather than forwarded, the maturity of Europe. The lives and labours of millions, which were buried in the East, would have been more profitably employed in the improvement of their native country. The accumulated stock of industry and wealth would have overflowed in navigation and trade, and the Latins would have been enriched and enlightened by a pure and friendly correspondence with the climates of the East. In one respect, I can indeed perceive the accidental operation of the Crusades, not so much in producing a benefit as in removing an evil. The larger portion of the inhabitants of Europe was chained to the soil, without freedom or property or knowledge, and the two orders of ecclesiastics and nobles, whose numbers were comparatively small, alone deserved the name of citizens and men. This oppressive system was supported by the arts of the clergy and the swords of the barons. The authority of the priests operated in the darker ages as a salutary antidote. They prevented the total extinction of letters, 
mitigated the fierceness of the times, sheltered the poor and defenceless, and preserved or revived the peace and order of civil society. But the independence, rapine and discord of the feudal lords were unmixed with any semblance of good, and every hope of industry and improvement was crushed by the iron weight of the martial aristocracy. Among the causes that undermined that Gothic edifice, a conspicuous place must be allowed to the Crusades. The estates of the barons were dissipated, and their race was often extinguished in these costly and perilous expeditions. Their poverty extorted from their pride those charters of freedom which unlocked the fetters of the slave, secured the farm of the peasant and the shop of the artificer, and gradually restored a substance and a soul to the most numerous and useful part of the community. The conflagration which destroyed the tall and barren trees of the forest gave air and scope to the vegetation of the smaller and nutritive plants of the soil. Digression on the family of Courtney The purple of three emperors who have reigned at Constantinople will authorise or excuse a digression on the origin and singular fortunes of the house of Courtney. In the three principal branches, one of Edessa, two of france and three of england of which the last only has survived the revolutions of eight hundred years one before the introduction of trade which scatters riches and of knowledge which dispels prejudice the prerogative of birth is most strongly felt and most humbly acknowledged in every age the laws and manners of the germans have discriminated the ranks of society the dukes and counts who shared the empire of charlemagne converted their office to an inheritance and to his children each feudal lord bequeathed his honour and his sword the proudest families are content to lose in the darkness of the middle ages the tree of their pedigree which however deep and lofty must ultimately rise from a plebeian root, and their historians must descend ten centuries below the Christian era before they can ascertain any lineal succession by the evidence of surnames, of arms, and of authentic records. With the first rays of light we discern the nobility and opulence of Atho, a French knight, his nobility in the rank and title of a nameless father, his opulence in the foundation of the castle of Courtney in the district of Gatinoise, about fifty-six miles to the south of Paris. From the reign of Robert, the son of Hugh Capet, the barons of Courtney are conspicuous among the immediate vassals of the crown, and Jocelyn, the grandson of Atho and a noble dame, is enrolled among the heroes of the First Crusade, a domestic alliance, their mothers were sisters, attached him to the standard of Baldwin of Bruges, the second count of Edessa, a princely fife which he was worthy to receive and able to maintain, announces the number of his martial followers, and after the departure of his cousin, Jocelyn himself was invested with the county of Edessa on both sides of the Euphrates. By economy and peace, his territories were replenished with Latin and Syrian subjects, his magazines with corn, wine and oil, his castles with gold and silver, with arms and horses. In a holy warfare of thirty years, he was alternately a conqueror and a captive. But he died like a soldier, in a horse litter at the head of his troops at his last glance beheld the flight of the Turkish invaders, who had presumed on his age and infirmities. His son and successor, of the same name, was less deficient in valour than in vigilance, but he sometimes forgot that dominion is acquired and maintained by the same arms. He challenged the hostility of the Turks without securing the friendship 
of the Prince of Antioch, and, amidst the peaceful luxury of Turbacel in Syria, Jocelyn neglected the defence of the Christian frontier beyond the Euphrates. In his absence, Zengi, the first of the Atabeks, besieged and stormed his capital Edessa, which was feebly defended by a timorous and disloyal crowd of Orientals. The Franks were oppressed in a bold attempt for its recovery, and Courtney ended his days in the prison of Aleppo. He still left a fair and ample patrimony, but the victorious Turks oppressed on all sides the weakness of a widow and orphan, and for the equivalent of an annual pension they resigned to the Greek emperor the charge of defending and the shame of losing the last relics of the Latin conquest. The Countess Dowager of Edessa retired to Jerusalem with her two children. The daughter, Agnes, became the wife and mother of a king. The son, Jocelyn III, accepted the office of Seneschal, the first of the kingdom, and held his new estates in Palestine by the service of fifty knights. His name appears with honour in the transactions of peace and war, but he finally vanishes in the fall of Jerusalem and the name of Courtney, in this branch of Edessa, was lost by the marriage of his two daughters with a French and German baron. 2. While Jocelyn reigned beyond the Euphrates, his elder brother Milo, the son of Jocelyn the son of Atho, continued near the Seine to possess the castle of their fathers, which was at length inherited by Reynold, or Reginald, the youngest of his three sons. Examples of genius or virtue must be rare in the annals of the oldest families, and in a remote age their pride will embrace a deed of rapine and violence. Such, however, as could not be perpetrated without some superiority of courage, or at least of power. A descendant of Reginald of Courtney may blush for the public robber, who stripped and imprisoned several merchants after they had satisfied the king's duties at Sens and Orleans. He will glory in the offence, since the bold offender could not be compelled to obedience and restitution till the regent and the Count of Champagne prepared to march against him at the head of an army. Reginald bestowed his estates on his eldest daughter, and his daughter on the seventh son of King Louis the Fat, and their marriage was crowned with a numerous offspring. We might expect that a private should have merged in a royal name, and that the descendants of Peter of France and Elizabeth of Courtenay would have enjoyed the titles and honours of princes of the blood. But this legitimate claim was long neglected and finally denied, and the causes of their disgrace will represent the story of this second branch. 1. Of all the families now extant, the most ancient, doubtless, and the most illustrious is the House of France, which has occupied the same throne above 800 years, and descends in a clear and lineal series of males from the middle of the ninth century. In the age of the Crusades, it was already revered both in the East and West. But from Hugh Capet to the marriage of Peter, no more than five reigns or generations had elapsed. And so precarious was their title, that the eldest sons, as a necessary precaution, were previously crowned during the lifetime of their fathers. The peers of France have long maintained their precedency before the younger branches of the royal line, nor had the princes of the blood in the twelfth century acquired that hereditary luster which is now diffused over the most remote candidates for the succession. 2. The barons of Courtenay must have stood high in their own estimation and in that of the world, since they could impose on the son of a king the obligation of adopting for himself and all his descendants the name and arms of their daughter and his wife. In the marriage of an heiress with her inferior or her equal, such exchange often required and allowed, 
but as they continued to diverge from the regal stem, the sons of Louis the Fat were insensibly confounded with their maternal ancestors, and the new Courtenays might deserve to forfeit the honours of their birth, which a motive of interest had tempted them to renounce. 3. The shame was far more permanent than the reward, and a momentary blaze was followed by a long darkness. The eldest son of these nuptials, Peter of Courtenay, had married, as I have already mentioned, the sister of the Counts of Flanders, the two first emperors of Constantinople. He rashly accepted the invitation of the barons of Romania. His two sons, Robert and Baldwin, successfully held and lost the remains of the Latin Empire in the East, and the granddaughter of Baldwin the Second again mingled her blood with the blood of France and of Valois. To support the expenses of a troubled and transitory reign, their patrimonial estates were mortgaged or sold, and the last emperors of Constantinople depended on the annual charity of Rome and Naples. While the elder brothers dissipated their wealth in romantic adventures, and the castle of Courtney was profaned by a plebeian owner, the younger branches of that adopted name were propagated and multiplied, but their splendour was clouded by poverty and time. After the decease of Robert, great butler of France, they descended from princes to barons. The next generations were confounded with the simple gentry. The descendants of Hugh Capet could no longer be visible in the rural lords of Tanley and of Champignel. The more adventurous embraced without dishonour the profession of a soldier. The least active and opulent might sink, like their cousins of the branch of Dreux, into the condition of peasants. Their royal descent, in a dark period of four hundred years, became each day more obsolete and ambiguous, and their pedigree, instead of being enrolled in the annals of the kingdom, must be painfully searched by the minute diligence of heralds and genealogists. It was not till the end of the sixteenth century, on the accession of a family almost as remote as their own, that the princely spirit of the Courtenays again revived, and the question of the nobility provoked them to ascertain the royalty of their blood. They appealed to the justice and compassion of Henry the Fourth, obtained a favourable opinion from twenty lawyers of Italy and Germany, and modestly compared themselves to the descendants of King David, whose prerogatives were not impaired by the lapse of ages or the trade of a carpenter but every year was deaf, and every circumstance was adverse to their lawful claims. The Bourbon kings were justified by the neglect of the Valois. The princes of the blood, more recent and lofty, disdained the alliance of his humble kindred. The Parliament, without denying their proofs, eluded a dangerous precedent by an arbitrary distinction, and established St. Louis, as the first father of the royal line. A repetition of complaints and protests was repeatedly disregarded, and the hopeless pursuit was terminated in the present century by the death of the last male of the family. Their painful and anxious situation was alleviated by the pride of conscious virtue. They sternly rejected the temptations of fortune and favour, and a dying Courtney would have sacrificed his son if the youth could have renounced for any temporal interest the right and title of a legitimate prince of the blood of France. 3. According to the old register of Ford Abbey, the Courtenays of Devonshire are descended from Prince Floris, the second son of Peter, and the grandson of Louis the Fat. This fable of the grateful or venal monks was too respectfully entertained by our antiquaries, Camden and Dugdale. But it is so clearly repugnant to truth and time that the rational pride of the family now refuses to accept this imaginary founder. Their most faithful historians believe 
that after giving his daughter to the king's son, Reginald of Courtenay abandoned his possessions in France, and obtained from the English monarch a second wife and a new inheritance. It is certain, at least, that Henry the Second distinguished in his camps and councils a Reginald of the name and arms, and, as it may be fairly presumed, of the genuine race of the Courtenays of France. The right of wardship enabled a feudal lord to reward his vassal with the marriage and estate of a noble heiress, and Reginald of Courtenay acquired a fair establishment in Devonshire, where his posterity has been seated above six hundred years. From a Norman baron, Baldwin de Brionis, who had been invested by the conqueror, Hawise, the wife of Reginald, derived the honour of Oakhampton, which was held by the service of ninety-three knights, and a female might claim the manly offices of hereditary viscount or sheriff, and of captain of the royal castle of Exeter. Their son Robert married the sister of the Earl of Devon, at the end of a century, on the failure of the family of Rivers, his great-grandson, Hugh the Second, succeeded to a title which was still considered as a territorial dignity, and twelve earls of Devonshire, of the name of Courtney, have flourished in a period of two hundred and twenty years. They were ranked among the chief of the barons of the realm, nor was it till after a strenuous dispute that they yielded to the fief of arundel the first place in the parliament of england their alliances were contracted with the noblest families the veres dispensers st john's talbots bohuns and even the plantagenets themselves and in a contest with john of lancaster a courtney bishop of london and afterwards archbishop of canterbury might be accused of profane confidence in the strength and number of his kindred in peace the earls of devon resided in their numerous castles and manors of the west their ample revenue was appropriated to devotion and hospitality and the epitaph of edward surnamed from his misfortune the blind from his virtues the good earl inculcates with much ingenuity a moral sentence which may however be abused by thoughtless generosity after a grateful commemoration of the fifty-five years of union and happiness which he enjoyed with mabe his wife the good earl thus speaks from the tomb what we gave we have what we spent we had what we left we lost but their losses in this sense were far superior to their gifts and expenses and their heirs not less than the poor were the objects of their paternal care the sums which they paid for livery and seizin attest the greatness of their possessions and several estates have remained in their family since the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries. In war, the Courtenays of England fulfilled the duties and deserved the honours of chivalry. They were often entrusted to levy and command the militia of Devonshire and Cornwall. They often attended their supreme lord to the borders of Scotland, and in foreign service, for a stipulated price, they sometimes maintained fourscore men-at-arms, and as many archers. By sea and land they fought under the standard of the Edwards and Henrys. Their names are conspicuous in battles, in tournaments, and in the original list of the Order of the Garter. Three brothers shared the Spanish victory of the Black Prince, and in the lapse of six generations the English Courtenays had learned to despise the nation and country from which they derived their origin. In the quarrel of the two roses, the earls of Devon adhered to the house of Lancaster, and three brothers successively died either in the field or on the scaffold. Their honours and estates were restored by Henry the Seventh. A daughter of Edward the Fourth was not disgraced by the nuptials of a Courtney. Their son, who was created Marquis of Exeter, enjoyed the favour of his cousin Henry the Eighth, 
and in the camp of cloth of gold he broke a lance against the French monarch. But the favour of Henry was the prelude of disgrace. His disgrace was the signal of death. And of the victims of the jealous tyrant, the Marquis of Exeter is one of the most noble and guiltless. His son Edward lived a prisoner in the tower, and died in exile at Padua, and the secret love of Queen Mary, whom he slighted, perhaps for the Princess Elizabeth, has shed a romantic colour on the story of this beautiful youth. The relics of his patrimony were conveyed into strange families by the marriages of his four aunts, and his personal honours, as if they had been legally extinct, were revived by the patents of succeeding princes. But there still survived a lineal descendant of Hugh, the first Earl of Devon, a younger branch of the Courtenays, who have been seated at Powderham Castle above four hundred years, from the reign of Edward the Third to the present hour. Their estates have been increased by the grant and improvement of lands in Ireland, and they have been recently restored to the honours of the peerage. Yet the Courtenays still retain the plaintive motto which asserts the innocence and deplores the fall of their ancient house. While they sigh for past greatness, they are doubtless sensible of present blessings. In the long series of the Courtney Annals, the most splendid era is likewise the most unfortunate. Nor can an opulent peer of Britain be inclined to envy the emperors of Constantinople, who wandered over Europe to solicit arms for the support of their dignity and the defence of their capital. End of chapter 61, part 4 Recording by Andrew Coleman